And Imam Al-Junaid, uh, he said, إن أمرنا هذا مناطم بالكتاب والسنة فمن لم يقرأ الكتاب ويحفظ السنة فلا يتحدث فيه أو كما قال He said that this affair of ours and he's talking about Sufism is restricted by the book, the Quran and the Sunnah, the path of the Prophet Muhammad So whoever does not recite and memorize the Quran and understand it and, and understand the path of the Prophet Muhammad and know his tradition then let them not speak in this affair of ours. Now, the scholars have always recognized that Islam has disciplines. There is a famous hadith. It's called Hadith Jibreel. And it's narrated by Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu. And it's in Bukhari and Muslim. Where he says that, بَيْنَمَا نَحْنُ جُلُوسٌ عِنْدَ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ You know, the hadith starts with him talking about them being in the gathering of the messenger of God. And this man appears wearing completely white clothes, his hair is so dark and black, um, looks really clean, and he says, doesn't even look like he was traveling, which is really odd for people in the desert because he, he was clearly not out of town. Nobody knew who he was, and he didn't look like he was traveling. Um, and at the end of the hadith, the prophet explains that this was the angel Gabriel. He came in the form of a man. Now Gabriel sat down, and he started asking the prophet Muhammad four questions. The first one was, أخبرني عن الإسلام. Tell me about Islam. What is Islam? And he said, أن تؤمن أن تشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأن محمد رسول الله so that you bear witness that there is no God except for the one true God and that Muhammad is his messenger uh, to fast, to pray the five daily prayers, to fast the month of Ramadan, to pay your zakat, your poor due, and to perform the pilgrimage to Mecca if you are able to do so. This package, Islam, as in this hadith, how it's explained, this is what's called fiqh, jurisprudence, the science of jurisprudence. This is where you learn the rulings of how to pray, how to fast, how to, how to pay your zakat, how to perform your pilgrimage. All of this falls under the rubric of jurisprudence, the rulings of Islam. Then he asked them, أخبرني عن الإيمان, tell me about faith. What is faith? And he said, أن تؤمن بالله وملائكته وكتبه ورسوله واليوم الآخر والقدر خيره وشره. That you believe, that's what faith is, that you believe in God and His angels and the revealed books uh, and the messengers and in the day, in the day of judgment, the last day, and to believe in the divine destiny, good and bad of it, that it's all from God. That's faith. The scholars put this package, they package this together, and they say this falls under ilmul aqaid. This is the science of creed, theology, if you will. And that's where you have all of these different theological discussions between Muslim scholars. Then he asked them, أخبرني عن الإحسان. Tell me about excellence. Ihsan is excellence, doing something to the highest degree. And he said, أن تعبد الله كأنك تراه فإن لم تكن تراه فإنه يراك. That you worship God as if you see Him. And if you don't see him, know that he sees you. That right there is what's called ilm tasawwuf This is the science of Sufism. Now, when it comes to Sufism, what comes to people's minds usually is some people dancing around while listening to poetry and bouncing up and down. I've actually seen videos of some of them breakdancing while they're listening to, uh, to uh, songs. And they call that as a form of remembrance of God. Or you see some ignorant activities of going to grave sites and asking the dead uh, for blessings or things like that and paying money and thinking that they're going to get something. Uh, or going to somebody and asking him to write them something and put it in their pocket and go and now they'll be forgiven or you know, doing things like that, amulets and whatnot. All of that is not in the sunnah. All of that is, can be rejected. And all of that is not Sufism. This is just ignorant activities done by ignorant people. When it comes to Sufism, if we take this hadith and explain, for example, the rulings of prayer. I could tell you what would make your prayer valid and how you can invalidate your prayer just from external actions. But the Prophet Muhammad said, there are many people who, get, who leave their prayer after they're done and only half of it was written for them. Some will only get a third. Others will only get a fourth. Others will get an eighth. 
So there is an understanding that even though you've completed the prayer externally, properly, and in a valid way, you only got half of it rewarded for you. Or you only got a quarter of it in rewards. What's there? What's missing? That's where ilm tasawwuf comes in. That's where Sufism comes in. That's where you start to focus on your state while you're praying and, know, and start to learn how to improve your state while you're praying. This is not an issue of jurisprudence anymore. Uh, it's like fasting, for example. I can tell you what are the external things that will make a valid fast or invalidate your fast. That's fiqh, that's jurisprudence. But the Prophet Muhammad also says, there are people who fast, completely valid externally, but the only thing that they would get from it is hunger and thirst. They don't actually get the reward for it. Well, what happened there? Because Allah says in the Quran, O you who believe, fasting has been prescribed upon you as it has been prescribed upon the people that have come, be that have come before you so that you may gain awareness of God. So while you're fasting, you're supposed to be in a different state than when you're not. And it's a state of awareness where you're completely aware of your actions. If you're completely aware of your actions, you notice that when we finish a month of Ramadan, for example, 30 days, 29 or 30 days of fasting, that first day or two, we feel very strange when we go and eat in the daytime or drink water. We think, am I fasting? Is it Ramadan? You're in a state of hyper-awareness of your actions where you're no longer in automatic mode, autopilot just eating and drinking. When you're fasting, it's not just eating and drinking, it's also talking behind people's back, using foul language, uh, looking down upon people, making fun of people, I mean, uh, checking out the opposite sex without, uh, without uh, having the right to. I mean, a lot of things come into play and you're becoming aware of your actions so that you're not transgressing the limits. That's what taqwa is. That's what that verse says, so that you may gain awareness of God, that you may gain awareness of your actions to stop doing the prohibited and conform with the permissible. That's where Sufism comes in. It teaches you how to watch your heart. Sufism is different from fiqh, for example, in one other aspect. Backbiting, I can tell you backbiting is that you mention someone behind their back with qualities that they don't like to be said about them. That's backbiting. That's the fiqh of backbiting. That's the jurisprudence, external ruling of it. And it's impermissible. But then you have someone like Imam al-Ghazali, for example, telling you that actually there is a higher level of this, which is backbiting of the heart. Where you're not telling someone, it's your heart telling you when someone passes by something that they don't like about themselves. Is that externally impermissible? Well, no one can judge your internal state like that, but that affects your heart. That is not giving you a pure heart. And so Imam al-Ghazali, when it comes to this, he gives you a recipe of how you can clean your heart from these things. That's the science of Sufism. That's what Sufism is about. It's about getting into this state. Now, Imam, Imam Malik said, مَن تَفَقَّهَ وَلَمْ يَتَصَوَّفْ فَقَدْ تَزَنْدَقْ وَمَن تَصَوَّفَ وَلَمْ يَتَفَقَّهْ فَقَدْ تَفَسَّقْ What this means is whoever takes on jurisprudence, fiqh only, and they don't take Sufism, they will become a heretic. Because if you only do fiqh, you can find opinions and loopholes in the law all over the place. And if you don't have the state of awareness of God, you will think you're, oh, I'm, I'm perfectly within the legal system. I'm not breaking the law. I have this opinion and that opinion. I can explain this thing that way and that way. That's why he says you become a heretic. But then on the other flip side, whoever takes on Sufism, but does not learn fiqh, does not learn the law, that person will break the law. فَقَدْ تَفَسَّقْ They will sin. So he says, وَمَنْ جَمْعَ بَيْنَهُمَا فَقَدْ تَحَقَّقْ Whoever combines between the two of them has achieved the true reality of what Islam is about. Imam al-Shafi'i, his student, he said a beautiful line of poetry. He said, فَقِيهًا وَصُوفِيًّا فَكُنْ لَيْسَ وَاحِدًا فَإِنِّي وَحَقِّ اللَّهِ إِيَّاكَ أَنْصَحُ فَهَذَا قَاسٍ لَمْ يَذُقْ قَلْبَهُ تُقًا وَهَذَا جَهُولٌ فَكَيْفَ يَصْلُحُ ذُو الْجَهْلِ He said, a jurist, a, a, a man of law, or a Sufi, don't be one of them, only one of them. 
For by God I'm giving you sincere advice. For the jurist is one whose heart is hard-hearted. His internal state is hard. And the Sufi, just the Sufi, is an ignoramus. They don't know the law. So how would you expect someone who doesn't know the law to be rectified? You need to get both of them together. And that's what really Sufism is about. It's not just about sitting together and singing the sheets, you know, singing Islamic songs and, and you know, getting together and having coffee and, and just relaxing. And it's hard work. It is the greatest of jihads. You know, when the Prophet Muhammad said in the hadith that when they're coming back from battle, he said, we've come back from the smaller jihad, the lesser jihad, to the greater jihad. That jihad the scholars have always recognized to be jihad and nafs, you know, the internal jihad. That I fight my own ego, my low desires, my low instincts, so that I can elevate and not debase myself, so that I can get to a higher station. And that's really what Sufi